to John chapter 13 as we continue our walk through the book of John beginning in verse 12 and I want us to look this morning at a picture of servanthood beginning in verse 12 so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again he said to them do you know what I have done for you. Now we back up to verse 7 from last week. Jesus answered and said, What I do now, you do not realize now, but you'll understand hereafter. So he's asking a rhetorical question. Do you know what I've done for you? In Luke chapter 24, verse 45, he said, He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He told them, he said, you don't understand now, but you're going to understand later. Now he's starting to explain to them what he is doing, what's taking place. You see what he's teaching? He's given a lesson here that we all need to learn. He's teaching them to obey when they don't understand. God wants you to know what's going on, but he also tells us we must ask. Does he not? Yeah. What does he say in James? James chapter 1 and verse 5. He's She skipped one on me. Huh? James chapter 1 verse 5. He said, you have not because you ask not. But if you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach. And it will be given to him. One of the things I pray for, and you're going to say, well, this doesn't get answered, Pastor, and that's okay, you can have your opinion. But one of the things that I pray for every morning when I pray, Lord, give me wisdom and give me discernment. I think the two go together. Mm -hmm. One without the other. Solomon asked for wisdom. God gave him wisdom, but his discernment was pretty bad. 
We know how he lived. So ask God. God promises, folks. Aiden Rogers preached on this last night. And we alternate between watching Adrian Rogers and Tony Evans. And last night was Adrian's night. And he made the statement about this. He said, well, many times we pray, well, God, if it's in your will. Well, if you read God's word, you know what's in his will. Mm -hmm. And when you get a statement like that, when God says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Yeah. Who gives to all generously and without reproach. You don't pray a prayer and say, well, Lord, if it's your will, give me wisdom. You already know it's his will. Mm -hmm. Ask God to give you wisdom. Ask him to give you discernment. To, that way you'll find yourself knowing how to make the right decisions. How to make the right choices. God will give you wisdom if you ask for it. Amen. But you have, you have to ask. James also says something. I didn't put a PowerPoint up. But he also says you can't ask in doubt. We used to have a preacher had a really good saying. You could pray and believe and receive. You can pray and doubt and do without. That's right. So, it, it, God, you know, there are certain promises that God gives us, folks. We have to, we have to ask ourselves, how strong do I believe God? Do I really believe He'll do what He says He's going to do? And when you believe it, you go over to Mark 12, I think that's Mark 12, 24, something like that, where He says, when you ask anything in His name, just believe you already received it. Because we have His promise. Folks, it's real simple. It's not complicated. If God says you can have it, it's yours for the asking. Yeah. If He says you can have it. So He said, do you know what I've done to you? And look, He goes further. He says, you call me teacher and Lord. And you're right. For so I am. Teacher means master. The master. Lord means he's our ruler. He owns us. We are his. But notice what you'll never see in the New Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament do you hear any of the disciples or any of them refer to him by his, just Jesus. They never call him by his first name. It's, it's master. Lord, can you imagine how we've lessened that? In the Old Testament, they didn't even mention one of his name to pass their lips. He was so holy. And yet today, we think nothing of just throwing his name out there. Oh, oh bless you. Oh, Jesus. That's true. Oh, Jesus. Bless him, Jesus. A bad one. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's even worse. Yeah. When we pray, we just you repeat the Lord's name over and over and over. You don't talk to people like that. If I started a conversation with you and just kept repeating your name every time I said something, you'd think I was going off the rock. Yeah, I may be. That's, that's beside the point. We won't go there. But, but you know, God's name is holy. No word do they just refer to him as Jesus. He said, you call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for so I am. So the question we need to ask ourselves, what do you call him? You say, well, I call him Savior. He's my Savior. Well, let me clue you in on something. This is God's word. This is not Pastor Ron. If he's not your Lord and Master... He's not your Savior. Mm -hmm. You can sit in church every week. You can hold office in church. You can do all the things you're supposed to do. If He's not your Lord and Master, if He's not Lord of your life, He's not your Savior. He said, you're right. So you call me teacher and Lord. I'm your teacher. I'm your Master. I'm your Lord. Yeah. You belong to me. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Now, how do we do that? There are some churches that took this literally. They took it as the third sacrament. Baptism, Lord's Supper, and feet washing. There are some churches that took this literally. He didn't mean it literally. Let me explain to you what he's talking about. 
He said, we're to wash one another's feet. Now, Jesus taught by example. But we look here, first of all, in the Bible, you, all right, you use water to wash feet, right? Hopefully. A little hard to wash them with dust. You wash, use water to wash feet. In the, war, in the Bible, water, the Word of God is referred to as the living water. So here we have the water is the Word. And the feet are our ways. It's when the things we do, when we sin. So how, if so, how are we going to wash each other's feet when we apply God's Word to a wayward brother or sister and we share with them and point out to them in love how they are outside of God's Word, how they're sinning. We're washing their feet. Jesus gave us this example. Now, if you're going to wash your feet, there's two things you do not want to use to wash your feet. Number one, you don't want to put your feet in scalding water. They won't stay there long. But on the other end of the spectrum, I don't think you want to wash your feet in ice cold water. Now, don't miss this. It's the same way when we correct a brother or sister in Christ. You don't come at them with fire and brimstone and correct them. You don't come at them with an ice cold authoritism and point out to them how unholy they are. No, you go to them in love and lukewarmness and warm water comfortable water and you meet them where they are and you point out to them do you really think you should be doing this is this pleasing to God and you point it out to them in love you'll never reach them with hot water or ice cold water the only chance you got to reach them is you meet them where they are and first of all by the way before you go witness to them go look in the mirror and make sure you got your act together. What did Jesus say before you take that splinter out of your brother's eye? What did he say? Take, your own eye. take the log out of your own eye. We're really good at pointing out splinters. It's amazing how we overlook those logs. <laughs> but he said here, Matthew chapter 18, 15, which he was trying to get up while going, I'll probably put it out of order. If your brother sins, Go and show him his fault in private. Let me just stop there before I finish that. When you see a brother or sister living in sin, doing something they shouldn't do, nowhere does the Bible say you need to go tell everybody else what they're doing. You don't see that. Now, we'd like to get on Facebook, Twitter, the phone, and, oh, I got a prayer request. That's how we couch it a lot of times. We got a prayer request. So-and-so is doing this, would you pray for him? That's gossip. No, the Bible says when you see a brother or sister doing something that's out of God's will, they're living in sin, go to them in private and show them their fault. If they listen to you, you've won your brother. Now, all you can do is point it out to them. What they do with it, that's between them and God. You don't have to answer to it. They have to answer for it. But you go to them in private. If it's done in private, you keep it private. He doesn't give you the uh, freedom to go and share it with everybody else. You start doing that, you better look at Romans. Paul said in Romans that you know you accuse them of doing these things. That just proves you know what that you know it's wrong, and you need to look at your own life and how you're living. So don't tell people. Try, try to tell people how to live a holy life if you're not living a holy life. Ouch. Yeah. Shared some of that this morning in Sunday school. We were talking about how you can find out how close you're walking with the Lord. And, uh, he'll put you in a position to find that out. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul points it out. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all generously and without reproach that it will be given to him. The same, he's referring to the same thing that James talked about. The very same thing. If you lack wisdom, just ask. He'll give it to you. Now, Look at verse 15. He said, I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. 
Jesus taught by example. Little book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 6. The one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk in the same manner as he walked. Today's language. If you're going to talk the talk, walk the walk. If you're not going to walk the walk, don't talk the talk, folks. That, that there's a word for that in the Bible. Everybody know what that one is? Hypocrite. Yeah, hypocrite. Absolutely. More people have been kept out of church by watching people who go to church than probably any other thing. Well, if they can go to church and live like that, I'm as good as they are. Well, the sad part is you probably are. But the sad part is you both lost. You know, we can't compare ourselves to somebody else. Wrong yardstick. We compare ourselves to Jesus. When we do, we find ourselves falling way short. Way short. He said, truly, truly. Now, anytime he says truly, truly, you sit up and take notice. I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, no one, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. You see, he had to bring the disciples down a little bit. Don't you imagine disciples had a little pride? They were walking with the Messiah. They were his chosen twelve. Now we, you may not see it a lot in what they say, and but you know they had a little. They thought of themselves pretty high up because they were walking with the Messiah. He chose them to walk with him. But he says, truly, truly, a slave is not greater than his master. Luke chapter twelve, in verse forty-seven. That slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. Something that needs to be taught to anybody that wants to lead. I don't care if it's a company, if it's, if it's in the church, if it's in a company, if it's in a business, whatever it is. Heard this many years ago and it's so true. If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. Folks, as God's children, nothing should be below us except sin. But if you think you're too big to serve, if you think that job, that position is below you, you don't deserve to be a leader. Great leaders lead. When you lead, you're out in front. You're not back in the back telling everybody else what to do. You're in front leading. That's why it's called leading. Many people like to stand back and be in control. They like to tell everybody what they need to do and how they need to live, and what, but they're not willing to lead by example. If you're too big to lead, to serve, you're too small to lead. So he, he goes on here. And he says in verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. What things? James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it's sin. Well, that's pretty simple. It's not complicated. If you know what God says you should do and you don't do it, it's sin. Now, somebody that doesn't know may do the same thing. It's not counted to them as sin until they find out that they're not supposed to be doing it. God does not hold you guilty of something that you do not know is wrong. But if you know what God's Word says, if you know it's wrong, and you do it anyway, it doesn't make any, makes no difference what your excuse is for doing it or what your reason is for doing it. If you know it's wrong and you do it anyway, it's a sin. As we said last week, when you confess your sins, you don't confess them all at one time. You committed them one at a time, confess them one at a time. So he said, if you know these things, but here's the other side, you are blessed if you do them. Psalm 103, verse 17 and 18. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting 
to everlasting on those who fear him, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts and do them. So the other side of the coin, if you know it's wrong and you do it, it's a sin. If you know it's right and you obey Jesus, he said you're blessed. We get to choose. We get to choose if God blesses us or not. Now, a lot of people want God's blessing. The problem is they don't want to live for him. Just be real, just bottom line here. You can't go out here and live in the world the way you want to live and expect God to bless you. Amen. It's not going to happen. God does not bless disobedience. If you want God's blessing, he tells us right here how to get it. He said, obey me, I'll bless you. He says in Malachi, open the windows of heaven, I'll pour out the, the blessings. The windows of heaven, just open them, you won't be able to handle them. Folks, when God starts blessing you, if you're walking with God and he starts blessing you, get you a big bucket. Yes. <laughs> because you can't handle it, God's blessings. He's blessed me so much in the last few weeks. He's blessed me my whole life. But boy, the last few weeks, it's just... Hallelujah. God and I have been walking close together the last few weeks. We've had some great talks. As I've told you in Sunday school, sometimes the last, in the last two or three weeks, there's times I felt like I almost heard God speaking to me. That'll shake you up. Verse 18. I do not speak to all of you, though. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the Scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Folks, if you're walking with God, if you love him, if you're obeying him, he knows you. He knows you're his. Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. It's not complicated. Oh, by the way, it's not easy. If it was easy, anybody could do it. No, it's not easy. We're living in a world out here that belongs to Satan. This is his domain. Until, until Jesus takes the keys back, this is his domain. And we're living among them. But it's like being in a boat. You can be in a boat in the middle of the ocean. As long as you're in a boat and the boat's in the ocean, you're still safe. It's when the ocean gets in the boat that you have a problem. When God's children are in the world, we're still safe. If, you're, if we're obeying Him and following Him, we're still safe because He'll put His hedge of protection around us. He'll walk with us. He'll bring us through it. Even when we don't understand it, He'll bring us through it. Yeah. But when we let the world get into us, we're separating ourselves from God because he says you can't serve two masters. You'll love one and you'll hate the other. So he's giving us a formula here. He said, he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. The psalmist spoke about that back in Psalm 41 and verse 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. This is talking about what's going to happen thousands of years later. It's not like God was surprised that Judas turned on him. God blesses obedience. Now look at verse 19. From now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am He. Lord. Did you catch those two words? I am. I am. Jesus said, I am the great I am. John chapter 17, verse 12. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but, which one? The son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. As I spoke of last week, isn't it amazing? God showed his servanthood and showed his 
humility. He washed Judas's feet before Judas went out to betray him. When Judas came up and kissed him on the cheek in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, friend, would you betray me with a kiss? He never stopped loving Judas. Even after Judas threw the money into the temple and, and ran out, if he'd have run, run back and asked God to forgive him, Judas would have been saved. He, get this, our God, if the man who betrayed him and sent him to the cross, if he had asked Jesus to forgive him, Amen. he would have forgiven him and he would have been saved. Amen. So don't you ever think you've done anything that's so bad that God can't forgive you. You don't know my God. You can't sin enough that God can't forgive you unless you reject Him. The only sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's simple, folks. So what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It's when you reject the Holy Spirit. Because the only way you can be saved is to repent and ask the Holy Spirit to come and live within you and ask Jesus to forgive you. If you reject that, there is no other way. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. There is no other way. If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, if you reject that person, that's the unforgivable sin. In other words, the door is always open. All you have to do is ask. But the devil would like to tell you, well, yeah, but if you're really a Christian, you wouldn't do this, and you wouldn't have done that. And look at all these things. Aren't you ashamed of that? Aren't you ashamed? Well, by the way, when you come to Jesus and fall on your face and you ask him, you repent and ask Him to forgive you, you ought to be ashamed. Amen. That's a problem we have in this world today. we got too many people that are sinning, too many people who think they're Christians that are sinning, and they're not ashamed. If you can sin before the Lord and not be ashamed, you need to check your salvation. You should be ashamed. In fact, even Christians that are trying to walk with Him when we go before Him and ask Him to forgive us when we sin every day, we need to do it with a humble heart and be ashamed of what we've done. Because folks, if we just remember this, every time you sin against God, it breaks His heart. It breaks his heart. He loves you. Amen. He created you to be with him in eternity. And when you sin against him and when you turn away from him, it breaks his heart. But he loves you enough that he's not going to make you come back. Because there's no love in that. <coughs> He'll do everything in the world to draw you back. And the moment you come back and the moment you repent and the moment you ask Him to forgive you, He'll forgive you and wash the slate clean. But He won't make you come back. Because He loves you too much for that. He loved us too much to make us like robots. We have a choice. We can follow Him or we can follow Satan. Amen. There is no middle ground. You're either walking with the Lord or you're walking with Satan. There is no middle ground. But you can't do enough that you can't turn to Him and ask Him to forgive you. He swore by blaspheming the Holy Spirit. No, if, if you get to that point, if you get to that point, if you turn that, if you reject Him that much, then you'll be able to live in sin and it won't bother you at all. Folks, once you get to that point, you've crossed the line of no return. If you go out here and live in sin, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 says you can. If you're a Christian, it says you cannot live in sin because the Holy Spirit is in you and He will not let you live in continual sin. So if you can go out and live in continual sin, the reason is because the Holy Spirit's not convicting you. The reason the Holy Spirit's not convicting you is because He's not living in you. When He moves into you, you're not going to live in sin. The sad part is we all sin every day. There's a difference between sinning every day. We, we do things we shouldn't do. We don't do things we should do. There's a difference between that and knowing that something is sin and we're just deliberately going to go out and do it anyway. Be careful. God will let you go for a while. But it's like walking on a frozen lake. There may be a patch out there that's not quite as thick as the rest of it. And He'll let you get out on that thin ice. And if you stay out there too long, 
he'll let you go through that thin ice. Be careful about rejecting God and saying, no, I'm going to do it my way. Hell is going to be full of people that did it their way. Truly, truly, uh-oh, there it is again. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. You know, basically, we don't like to hear this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So what's different from when? <laughs> Everybody looks down on Judas. You betrayed Jesus. Think of this. If you know in your heart what Jesus wants you to do, and you don't do it, and you reject Him, you're as guilty as Judas. Never think of it that way? Sin is sin, isn't it? Just thought I'd throw that in, that's for free. If you receive him, you receive the one who sent him. John chapter 20, verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. When our brothers or sisters sin against us, we are called to forgive them the same way God forgave us. But they don't deserve it, neither did you. God said, you forgive, love your enemies, forgive it when people sin against you. And there's another thing that's not quite written out, but he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19 and 20, and I'll give it to you in layman's terms. He said, leave them to me. Let me judge them. I can judge them better than you can. I'll take care of the judging. You take care of the witnessing, I'll take care of the judging. We're not called to be judges. We're called to be witnesses. So what's he expect us to do? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and witness. Share the gospel. Use words when necessary. But he said, You don't have to go by yourself. If you'll go, I'll go with you. Aren't you glad you don't have to do it in your strength? Aren't you glad he promised that if you'll just open your mouth, if you'll open your mouth, he said, I'll put the words in it. If you'll live for me in front of them as a witness, I'll give you the ability to live for me. Folks, we're not in this battle alone. When you're walking with Jesus, 